Good morning. I'm with Ceres, the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences, also affiliated with uh, the track that uh, Tom discussed and Eric. Um, but I'm actually based at the Space Weather Prediction Centre, which is the NOAA lab, and they're the, uh, the nation's official provider of the space weather, space weather forecasts. And Tom gave you a good outline of the sort of the main driver of space weather, which is, of course, is the solar variability, the uh, solar flares, the coronal mass ejections, driving geomagnetic storms, um, solar proton events, the energetic particles coming from the sun. But what I wanted, and he also mentioned, that um, that's not the only source of space weather. And of course, when you have a, a big event on the sun, that, that dominates, dominates space weather. Uh, an extreme event, uh, you, you don't have to worry about other sources coming from the lower atmosphere. But I, what I wanted to stress was that there is another, this other source coming from tropospheric weather, waves propagating up from the lower atmosphere. Because the ionosphere is variable all the time. Every day, you don't just wait for a geomagnetic storm to see the fluctuations in the ionosphere. Those fluctuations, the irregularities in the ionosphere, are there all the time, and they're impacting satellite communication, satellite navigation, HF propagation for geolocation or, or communication again. So, um, so what, what we're trying to do is to uh, we take the um, the of course we're based at the, uh, the at the NOAA lab, so we have the access to the operational weather model. So what we did, we, we took the weather model, which uh, currently goes up to about 60 kilometers altitude, and we extended that by a factor of 10. So that goes from the ground up to 600, 600 kilometers altitude. And so you're actually modeling the dynamics of the atmosphere all the way up, even to the top of the atmosphere, really, when, before you go out into space. And that neutral atmosphere, if you can couple all, all of those irregularities and, and variations of the neutral atmosphere with the plasma, you can actually follow how the, the ionosphere, the, the plasma, responds to all of these. So we, uh, we have a model for that. And, and of course, since, since we're building it upon the operational weather model, we can use all the data assimilation capability of the weather model. We run it at a lower resolution, but um, all, the, all the observations of uh, tropospheric weather that are used to do our, our daily forecast that, uh, that you can see on a day-to-day -day basis, you can use all that data in a whole atmosphere model, so you can actually follow real weather events the, uh, the strength of tropical convection, uh, storms across the, the Midwest, or um, uh, the strength of the, uh, um, the jet stream, all of those sources of uh, variability in waves, uh, we can follow all of those and actually predict them a, a few days ahead. So we, um, the, the opportunity, the impact is that we're able to follow all of these, um, these real weather events and propagate uh, them up into the upper atmosphere and of course, we can also, the weather model is improving uh, all the time, and so we can build upon that, those gradual improvements of the, uh, the lower atmospheric physics, and they're changing to a new dynamical core, which is a non-hydrostatic, uh, much lower uh, diffusion, uh, much lower uh, damping model, so we capture a lot more of the structure and the variability with this FV3 dynamical core. And of course, we can also use it for um, a neutral density prediction that Eric was talking about. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of. Uh, okay, let me go on. Is it going to start? Yeah, th this I hope will be an animation if it starts. Let's start. Sometimes, if you just click it too many times, there we go. So if you were to just to look at an empirical model or just a standalone upper atmospheric model, you would see a very smooth distribution up at 300 kilometers altitude or 200 kilometers altitude. The temperature would be very smooth and the wind fields would be very smooth. But this is what you really see. This is what you get at 200 kilometers altitude. If you add all of that wave, those wave sources, so all of those uh, tropical convection sources are uh, sending out gravity waves, the adjustments in, uh, in the polar jet, uh, there, there's all these sources of waves. So you don't just see this nice smooth pattern, you see all of this variability. And even when we run this model at 180 kilometer resolution, which is pretty coarse compared with the weather model, which is running at about uh, 10 or 15 kilometers, 
kilometer resolution. You're capturing a lot, a lot of the uh, the spectrum of waves that are propagating through the atmosphere. Eventually, of course, it cuts off because the you can't resolve a smaller scale structure with this uh, with this sort of resolution. And if you look at the real ionosphere. Uh, that is being driven by all of these waves, then this spectrum fills in here. And so we can't fill in the complete spectrum yet, but we, it would be nice to be able to run the whole atmosphere model at the same resolution as the weather model at about 10 or 15 kilometers altitude. Then you would start to fill in this whole spectrum. So this is um, and just another couple of example, another example of the... Um, so uh, there's... So the... You can imagine that the longitude, the, the land masses dictate a longitude structure in a lot of these wave sources, and that, that imprints a, a longitude structure on the ionosphere just on the large scale. So the, um, the example that I was going to show was just um, if you have, you see a large scale structure, but if you, see, if you have, say, an isolated um, a tropical convection, a, a large tropical convection, that's propagating up waves and you see that wave signature all the way up through the atmosphere. And those waves cause undulations on the ionosphere and, and you can see those in the, in the GPS maps. And it turns out that that wave structure is also generating um, ionospheric irregularities and instability at, at low latitudes. And the day-to-day -day variability of those, those irregularities are dependent on the, um, those wave sources to coming up from below. So, uh, and that's just that, that example. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's just an example of what those, that, uh, all these, what these irregularities look like when you're driven by these waves that are propagating up from the, from the lower atmosphere. And these are the concentric circles that you get from an isolated source and it propagates up and gen generates a, a convection uh, uh, the concentric circles of undulations in the ionosphere, which you can actually see in GPS maps. So that's my uh, that's my story, and I think we, um, so the space weather comes from the lower atmosphere and from the and from the uh, solar variability. Thank you.